Hi guys, this is Emily and thanks for joining me today on our autism presentation. The question we will be asking is, how do you know if you have autism? I'm Emily, I'm broadcasting for naturalhealthforlife.com and I'm an autism warrior mom too. I have a, a four-year-old, well, he was four when he got diagnosed and he's turning seven today. What so my son is on the autism spectrum and I have learned a lot on our journey. So I'm gonna be sharing that with you and today our focus will be how to know if you have autism. So if you have a kid with unusual behavior or as an adult, you've noticed some quirkiness or social challenges in your own life, you may be wondering if you have autism. And it's a good question, it's important. Autism is on the rise in children and in my opinion that's not just because of improved early detection or more liberal screening criteria. But that's a story for another video. Let's stick with the facts. We're going to talk about the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, a United States governmental agency that in 2014 reported that one out of 42 boys and one in 189 girls has autism. In other words, it is one of the most common childhood disorders and it can be a huge problem if you're severely affected. So let me put this out here now before we get into deep. If you're watching this and you're wondering if you may have autism, I think it would be worthwhile to have a professional evaluation. In my experience, a lot of people, including and especially our pediatrician and our occupational therapist, who we started seeing when we were three, were what I would call overly reassuring. Family members are also huge with this. They don't want you to worry. Everyone's a little different. I'm sure he'll grow out of it. There's nothing wrong with him. He just really likes XYZ. So to me, when my son's development started to stray from the normal trajectory, I didn't really know. He was my first kid. There were no other kids in the family. I don't like being around kids. Let's face it, I like to talk to grown-ups. So I didn't know. I wish someone had told me to get my butt into an autism center and get him evaluated as soon as I could. You should do the same. If it's not autism, it could be another type of learning disorder, neurological disorder, sensory disorder. There's a lot of junk floating around these days and the Autism Center can help point you in the right direction if you do not in fact have an autism diagnosis. The main thing is to get help, get early detection, and get things resolved. The sooner you start, the sooner you'll be done and often your recovery is more robust. So today we're going to be talking about the DSM-5, which is the diagnostic criteria that is used to uh, evaluate whether or not you have autism. It includes autism and Asperger's. These have kind of been clumped together, uh, PDD, NOS, ADD, ADHD. It's all sort of grouped into the autism spectrum right now. Um, people on the spectrum present in a wide variety of ways. That's why it's called the spectrum. There's an old saying in the autism world, if you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. Another person with autism, a similar diagnosis, may look and act quite different. So just because your little Johnny doesn't act like little Sammy down the street with autism, it doesn't mean that your little Johnny doesn't have autism. It just means that his array of symptoms looks a little bit different. Some autistics are labeled high functioning. And they may be seen as kind of asymmetrically smart, little professors with deep knowledge in some areas and deficits in other areas, especially around things that you would think would be common sense or just general purpose social skills that they should be able to pick up in the wild and they haven't assimilated for some reason. They may have problems with transitions going from one activity to another, even if they're routine going to the grocery store, going to the library, just doing something different as a meltdown. A meltdown is what we call a big tantrum. <laughs> you've seen a regular two-year-old tantrum and then you've seen an autistic two-year-old tantrum and it's a different league, let me tell you. <laughs> um, sometimes they might be fixed on their routine and seen as a little bit obsessive compulsive. They have to bring their certain toys with them in the car. They have to drive a certain route. I remember one time my son started crying 
in the car and I didn't know why and it turned out he was upset that we didn't get off at our regular freeway exit. He didn't realize we were going to the grocery store which required a different route and he was like, oh my goodness, we have gone a different way, this is a huge problem. So obviously as a result of these sort of compulsions, obsessions, transition problems, they often struggle with anxiety. And another thing to look out for is problems with verbal processing, specifically understanding and following commands or other communication. Sometimes we can be fooled because they might have a good vocabulary or talk about things that are fairly advanced, but talking about it is one thing and hearing it, understanding what it means, knowing what to do about it is a different skill. So what I just described is pretty much how my son happened to be and he didn't get diagnosed until he was four years old because he was so strong in some areas that it sort of let us compensate or make excuses for his weaknesses. Like, oh, he can't have autism. He likes to sit in my lap and snuggle. Or, oh, he can't have autism. He just really likes garbage cans and will beeline and crash through people when we get to any new building to go check their garbage cans. But that's just a little quirky. That doesn't mean it's autism. So you might say those are some symptoms that would have previously been so associated with Asperger's, but like I said, they're now kind of grouped onto the autism spectrum, which is actually good from an um, insurance coverage of your services perspective. So setting my son aside, that sort of high functioning autism description, I'm going to reinforce that there are definitely people who are more affected by autism who have a more involved case. And this is what, what we might think of as classical autism. And children who are in this range of functionality are often diagnosed around the age of two. And many parents actually report the onset of autistic symptoms after 18 month vaccines. Now, although our government appears to be uncomfortable admitting any kind of link between autism and vaccination, behind closed doors, many autism parents and even a few MDs have seen a clear correlation in certain cases, and not, not all autistics have a clear correlation, but some, you know, within hours of their vaccination, they're screaming, they have a rash, they have a fever. My own son did have, you know, a fussy fever reaction to some of his vaccines. I don't know if that's what threw him off his developmental trajectory. Some people have lost eye contact, lost speech, lost motor skills within hours or days of their routine vaccinations. And the parents essentially feel that their child is vaccine damaged. And the vaccines have taken a healthy and normally developing baby and turned him into a nonverbal, fussy, vacant, staring baby. And it's absolutely heartbreaking. And not every autistic parent has that story. And certainly not everyone who's gotten vaccinated has that story but it's worthwhile pointing out and um, noting that if you have other people with autism in your family, I don't want to get too deep into this, but um, some people have uh, a slower metabolism. They have more difficulty metabolizing out toxins. And so when you bombard their system with too many toxins, be them um, heavy metals, viruses, uh, bacteria, watch out for the antibiotics, um, whatever it is, sometimes the vaccine is just the straw that breaks the camel's back and an otherwise kind of difficult to get rid of the garbage uh, bodily situation. So, and that can run in families. A lot of times other family members will have asthma, they'll have eczema, they'll have IBS, they'll have anxiety, depression, alcoholism. Um, other kids in the family might have ADD. Uh, so if you have that kind of stuff happening in your family, those are all kind of warning flags like, oh, we're having trouble um, getting rid of some of the junk. You might want to be especially careful about vaccines in these situations and consider a reduced schedule of vaccines where you don't do all of the vaccines. You slow it down and you space them farther apart, or you might just not want to do any vaccines at all. So after my son was diagnosed, we stopped vaccinating him and my daughter. and. I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but that is what we're happening to do. And I think it's worth pointing out that although 
vaccines have been tested in a one-off basis. This vaccine is safe. That vaccine is safe. They haven't tested them as a group. Well, what if we give this child 10 vaccines in the course of six months? Is that safe? That hasn't been tested. So anyway, going, going back to my presentation here, off the soapbox, children who have low functioning autism are usually very apparent to their parents and get diagnosed right away. Um, often these children lose speaking skills or fail to develop them. They might appear vacant. They might do some of the classic, you know, no eye contact, lining up cars, spinning spinners on their toys, uh, pouring sand back and forth for hours. Um, they might do some physical gestures such as jumping, flapping their hands up and down, uh, vocal tics or repetitive noises. My son had a, a bit of echolalia, so I would say something like a phrase or a sentence and he would say it back. He didn't say mama, dada, um, blue cars. He would say, look, Blake, the cars are blue which is what I had just said. <laughs> so I was like, oh, he's talking. He's talking in sentences. This is great. But it actually wasn't that great. He wasn't breaking it down and understanding what the different words meant. He was just repeating sounds. So anyway, that can be fairly apparent. And when I post this on YouTube, I'll go ahead and put a link to the um, website where you can look at the diagnostic criteria for autism. But I want to point out that they're looking for weaknesses in several areas, but you don't necessarily need to have a problem in all of the areas. So if you just have, you know, three out of the four problems, that is enough to qualify you for an autism diagnosis. So number one here, we've got deficits in social communication and interaction. So if your child has trouble greeting his teachers at school or extended family members when you go over to their house for lunch, or they won't greet strangers even with parental support, um, that would be considered an, a deficit in social communication. I remember with my son, we would get to my grand, or his grandparents' house who lived about 15 minutes away. We saw them every week. He would always be trying to duck under their arm or run around them so he wouldn't have to do the hello and hug at the front door. He would just try to get away and go play with a toy or a book or something that he could do by himself without having to do the, um, the social niceties of saying hello to your hosts. Um, another one, they don't report on their social activities. So, or I'm sorry, they don't report on their activities. If they can't say, you know, what did you do at school today or tell me about your drawing, uh, my son would always say, you know, it's a secret, I can't tell you, I can't remember. Um, only until relatively recently in his recovery process was he able to start telling us you know, oh, you know, at music we sang this song, or we played a cool new game at PE, let me tell you the rules, stuff like that. Um, they have an unusual ability or lack of ability to have a conversation or tell a story. They don't understand the um, sort of social implications of hints, humor, euphemisms, and metaphors. They have trouble making eye contact, and they can't understand or interpret social expressions well, or facial expressions, excuse me. So those are all, you know, hey, did you notice that your sister is really mad at you because you just kicked her in the face? Like, oh, no, I didn't notice that. Oops. You know, don't care, not trying to fix it. Didn't notice it in the first place. You might have autism if. Okay, number two, restricted or repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. So flapping the hands, jumping, spinning the wheels of a car, insisting on the sameness, being rigid and having trouble with change. A lot of autistic kids are really picky eaters, guys. A lot of them are limited to a brown diet consisting mostly of the foods that are worst for them, including gluten and casein. So mac and cheese, giant glasses of milk, um, only eating french fries. These are some things that you know, they have to have chicken nuggets, and it can't be any chicken nuggets, it has to be the McDonald's chicken nuggets. Repetitive speech and using catchphrases. Um, my sister worked in an autism clinic, and she said that there was a girl who would look at medical textbooks and then would go around uh, re repeating phrases from those. So you knew it wasn't kind of normal conversation, it was very 
distinctive. Uh, they need to drive the same route to go certain places, eat the same food all the time. Okay, the next one is a strong interest in something specific. So these are kind of your, your classic preferred topics. Um, a lot of autistic kids really latch on to Thomas the Tank or trains in general. My son really liked garbage trucks, so he would not only watch our garbage truck, he would watch YouTube videos of garbage truck, which you could be amazed that they're like hour-long videos of garbage trucks dumping garbage, and it was fascinating, and he loved them. Some people watch uh, marble mazes there on YouTube or talk about comic books. The thing is that it's usually just one or two things, and they get really deeply into it, and they talk about it all the time. So, yeah, garbage, construction trucks, recycling lists. He could memorize what was recyclable and not recyclable. It's a skill, but it's not the skill we want you to develop right now. Um, and then number four here, this uh, DS DSM diagnostic list is hyper or hypoactivity in response to sensory input. So having sensory problems means that you might get overwhelmed by a certain stimuli or not notice certain stimuli. Um, for example, bright lights, fan noises, hot or cold um, weather or water. I remember Blake used to be, you know, out there on a 65 degree day waiting to jump into the 50 degree water when we would take him to the waiting pool here in Seattle. It was freezing cold, but it did not bother him. And um, the bathroom fan, when we would turn on the fan, you know, to take a bath or a shower, that was too noise and he, noisy, he would put his hands over his ears, or the heat light, he would squint his eyes. Um, he didn't like getting his fingernails cut, he didn't like washing his hair or um, having water on his head. And it wasn't just like, oh, I'm afraid it's getting soap in my eyes, it's like, I can't handle it. This is, you're going to have to hold me down if you want to make it happen. So overall, those are the, the categories and it notes at the end that the systems or the symptoms of autism cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of current functioning. So you have to look at their peers and what they're doing too. That's like, oh, I don't like getting my fingernails clipped, but I can handle it. Or, oh, I don't like getting my nails clipped, and I'm going to have a tantrum and require two adults to hold me down if you want to make this happen. You know, one might be normal or annoying, and one might be, wow, this is really... Um, impairing your day-to-day -day functioning. So anyway, those are the criteria. It can be a little bit um, technical, hard to understand. So there's another free tool that I want to show you that you can also take. It's a parent questionnaire. Uh, it can also, there's you can do it as a self-assessment for adults as well. It's called the ATEC, which stands for the Autism Treatment Evaluation Checklist. And a low score means that you have fewer autism symptoms, and a high score means that you're more highly impacted by autism. So low-functioning autistics could have a score of 100 or above, and if you score 10 or under, you are considered to be not technically on the autism spectrum anymore, although you might still be developing skills. A lot of times in recovery, we see autism kids come below 10. Uh, for example, my son, started, he's turning seven today, he started a year ago at six on a new protocol, so when he started that protocol, he, his ATEC was 21, and now his ATEC is five. He's in a mainstream kindergarten, he has a little bit of IEP support, and his main things are that he's working on developing friends, being flexible enough to do what the other kids want to do, and also getting rid of some obsessive compulsive stuff. So he still really likes to talk about preferred topics, but he's more open to input and back and forth conversation about them, and he's more easily moved off them when they're not appropriate. So anyway, I didn't know about the ATEC early on in our autism journey, so I don't know what Blake would have looked like at his worst. The first time I ran the test, we'd already been doing the GAPS diet for probably six months, and he scored a 39. So with a high functioning autism diagnosis, that might be around a 39. And he was able to go to a preschool at that point, but he was 
kind of moving away from kids. If they would come to a PlayStation, you know, the Play-Doh table or something, he would leave. So anyway, after being on GAPS, he improved a lot of his um, anxiety and toned down the tantrumings quite a bit. It was a big, the GAPS diet was a dietary tr treatment that we tried before we got diagnosed. Since we were on a six-month waiting list to be diagnosed, I wanted to do something because I was going crazy. So anyway, we did GAPS for about six months. Then we did a year of biomedical treatment that went well. He's kind of a slow and steady responder. And we also did all the traditional treatments that they tell you when you get diagnosed, the, the behavioral stuff. ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis, is what that stands for. Occupational Therapy, Speech Therapy. So after a year on that, he scored a 21. And then most recently, after nine months, like I was telling you, I guess, um, yeah, so he got down to a five after nine months on this protocol. Now we're a year in, but there we go. So after nine months of following Carrie Rivera's therapy, which is outlined in her book, Healing the Symptoms Known as Autism, which I strongly recommend and I will link you to in the bottom. Um, so after that, he got a five on his ATIC, which put him under the uh, diagnostic criteria. And the nice thing about this was that it was a lot cheaper as far as therapeutic interventions. Some can be pretty pricey. This one was cheap um, to implement. So like I said, he's still working on his social skills and some preferred speech topics, but overall he's blending in. And if you went to his class as a you know parent volunteer, you probably wouldn't notice that he had a problem. So um, anyway, here's the website where you can get the ATEC test, and I'll put that in the comments as well, uh, the description of the video I mean. And um, I wanted to point out a useful way to use the ATEC since it's free and it's online, it's quick, it takes about 10 minutes. A lot of people take their ATEC scores quarterly so they can have a gauge to see if the therapeutic interventions that they're trying are having a significant impact. So you want to see your ATEC getting lower and lower and lower to know that you're moving away from autism and into recovery. And if they're staying the same, then you might want to start trying something else because you can certainly improve and get rid of a lot of the autism symptoms. So do you have autism? Only a trained clinician can tell you for sure. But if you think you might, or even if you just have a few characteristics of autism but you don't meet the whole diagnostic criteria, you might as well get started on a home treatment plan of some kind. Um, while you're waiting to get diagnosed or just to see if you can resolve your issues yourself. There's a lot to do um, that you can do, I should say. There are a lot of different ways to skin the elephant, I, is the bottom line here. So even without a diagnosis, even without having your insurance pay for anything, um, you can still go ahead and get started. Don't use the lack of diagnosis as an excuse to delay your treatment. Children's hospitals often have an autism clinic with a six-month wait to get tested. That was what we found. And a little hint, if you call back every so often and find out if they have a cancellation, you might be able to squeeze in earlier, which was also what we did, and that was brilliant. <laughs> Somebody told me that trick. So that worked out really well. And also, after you get your autism diagnosis, then you'll be able to qualify, depending on your insurance, you might be able to qualify for your insurance to cover a lot of your autism therapy. We have basically unlimited speech therapy and occupational therapy and ABA coverage, which the ABA coverage is new. That's just starting to get added to plans. So even if you didn't have it before, check and see when it's coming to your insurance provider and call them and Talk to HR and see if you can make it happen because ABA is the most expensive and it takes a lot of hours. Sunrise and RDI are other um, things to look into. You can do ABA at home on your own. I'll try to do a review of some of the different um, interventions that we've done. But the bottom line is there's a lot you can do yourself, so don't wait for a diagnosis. What type of treatment is appropriate for you might depend on your health and your age, but a clean diet is huge. 
We like the GAPS diet, which stands for Gut and Psychology Syndrome. It's described in a book of the same name by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. She is a real doctor. She, her son got autism. She went back to school and studied more on nutrition. She adapted a gut health diet. Um, she had, What did I say? She had adapted it. She changed it slightly. Um, it was called the SCD diet for, I believe, simple carbohydrate diet. But it, the SCD diet was developed to help somebody else's daughter who had colitis, and she improved tremendously and the GAPS diet was built off of that and other things added onto it to make it um, suitable for healing someone with autism. And her son, who is now an adult, had an excellent recovery from autism. Other, he has a girlfriend. I mean, it doesn't get much harder socially than to manage that type of a relationship. So um, a gut health diet is an excellent place to start. I also strongly recommend the book Healing the Symptoms of Autism by Carrie Rivera, which I mentioned before. Out of all the interventions we tried, this book got us the most gains the most quickly, and I would say the GAPS diet was number two most effective, and we're still essentially on the GAPS diet, so that's been in the background of everything that we've done since then. So whatever you do, make sure that you do something. Subscribe to my channel at the very least so you can tune in to my future videos. We'll be doing more on autism, more on natural health, more on the different therapies that you can use. Um, but regardless of whether you're officially on the spectrum or just have some things that you want to work through, uh, the strategies that I'm going to be sharing on this channel are going to help um, tremendously. I have every confidence. So. Think about it and start your own recovery journey today with the recommendations that I've given you here on this video. Please, right now, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. You can also visit my website and join our email list. It's naturalhealthforlife.com. I've got some fun interviews lined up and there will be more uh, educational videos to come. So please join us and good luck with your healing journey.